Walter, you have thought a great deal about free will in your career from different perspectives, neuroscience, law, etc. Um, and then were a participant in the Big Questions in Free Will Project and did all the, um, all the sessions over the years. Uh, what's your perspective? Uh, the, the concept was that can we bring to free will a perennial problem some kind of new thinking? Can we? Well, I guess my answer would be some of us can. <laughs> because if I learned anything from this project, it's that some scientists are interested in philosophy and others are not. And some philosophers are interested in science and others are not. So take the science question first. You know, somebody who makes a clock, a clockmaker, might be thinking, what is it that I'm measuring? What is time? And how does the time that I'm measuring with my clock really relate to the way people experience time in their lives? And, and what would happen if there were no time? Other clockmakers just go, forget all that stuff. I just want to make a clock that's okay. going to keep time straight. Well, some scientists are like the clockmaker who wonders about these larger philosophical issues. And others, they just want to have a better clock. They want to do their science better and learn the facts better. Uh, and I love working with the scientists who have that philosophical curiosity as well. And this project has shown me that there are a lot of them out there who might be in their labs doing their experiments, getting their grants, doing their numbers, but they really want to do those experiments because they want to get the big questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of them, and there are a lot of them in the project. Uh, and those philosophers can work with. Do you see them making progress? Yes, I see them making progress. What kind of progress? Partly, it's removing barriers to common sense notions. You know, a lot of people want to believe in free will, and then there are these challenges. And you want to know, how can they possibly have free will if we've discovered this? And you need an alternative story. You just can't say, I'm going to stick with free will no matter what the science. Okay. You need an alternative scientific story that makes sense of what we think about free will and responsibility and how we can make the decisions that we do and act in the ways that we do and still have free will. Uh, despite the fact that neuroscience can explain it. Uh, the progress is made then by removing mistaken arguments that make some people think, well, if neuroscience discovered this, therefore nobody's got free will. Or neuroscience discovered this about this individual, therefore that person's not responsible. Uh, very rare occasions, it's you thought this person was responsible and neuroscience has discovered that they're really not because of something weird about mm -hmm. the causal system. Mm -hmm. But usually, it's these minor moves and removing obstacles uh, where the progress is made. Not like there's going to be one experiment and all of a sudden people are going to go, ah, yeah, right. free will after all. <laughs> right. Or no free will. Exactly. Or no free will yeah, after yeah. all. Yes, one experiment's not going to do it. Some scientists would say, sure, philosophers who are interested in free will has to talk to me because I have the damn using science, you know, one scientist to personify the whole class. Uh, you sure have to talk to me because I have data, but I don't have to talk to you uh, because what I'm doing is I don't care what the philosophy is. I'm just doing good experimental designs and discovering one thing after another. Right. They're going to say that, sure, and philosophers are going to say, I can discuss for you without looking at the science. Some philosophers will. The scientists who say, I can discuss free will without talking to philosophers, are often taking things for granted that they're not even aware of. Such as? They're drawing conceptual distinctions between, like, what do you mean by free will? A lot of neuroscientists will give you an answer that's off the cuff that they haven't really thought through, mm -hmm. and that when you do think through, it's just incoherent. Like, well, it's not really free will if there's any cause at all. You say, well, why do you think that? What do you mean by causation? Why does causation remove free will? Does all causation have to be deterministic? Uh, what do you mean by will? What are you counting as a will? Does it count as a will if it's not conscious? And so on and so on. There are a lot of conceptual issues that you have to get straight before you can even begin to do the right experiments or to draw the right conclusions from the experiments. The experiment that you were involved in with the readiness potential that some people say uh, eliminates free will because it occurs before you have a conscious awareness of, of at least uh, um, uh, 
proximal actions of a very simple kind. Uh, others say that um, there's a big difference between real free will that has to do with deliberation and, and, and this experiment really doesn't address that at all. What's your overview, uh, considering that you're a compatibilist and believe that you can have free will in a deterministic world? Well, my overview is that from the original experiments on readiness potentials by Libet and others, uh, many people have followed out chains of argument that lead to there being no free will. And most of those arguments are bad. Why? Uh, because there's a natural explanation of why you would have the very pattern that was observed in the experiment, even if people do have free will and really do control their actions. Namely, the brain activity occurs, then consciousness of will occurs, and the brain activity causes the consciousness of will, and then the consciousness of will causes the action, right? Mm -hmm. That's the temporal order. Right, that right. could be the causal order. Right. So there's a perfectly natural interpretation of the original Libet experiments that's compatible with common sense about free will. But that's not the only argument. What people think is, once I've gotten rid of that argument, now Libet's just totally irrelevant. And I don't believe that. I think there are other more subtle questions we have to ask, such as, is that consciousness of free will an essential part of the causal chain that runs from that brain activity, the readiness potential, to the action? Does consciousness really play a role at all in the production of that action? And if not, that makes us rethink some of our assumptions about how we're acting in the world and about whether we're responsible for our actions in the world. That sounds very significant then. Yes. So I think it could be significant, but we don't know what that role of consciousness is. I would agree with another thing you said, which is if consciousness plays no role in these very simple actions that Libet was studying, that doesn't show that consciousness plays no role when I get married or choose a career or go to war or do any of the larger scale things that are much more meaningful in our lives. Uh, those are very difficult to study in a controlled way because if you do neural experiments on people while they're getting married, uh, you're not going to have a lot of volunteers and you know that your volunteers are very weird people. And so it's, you can't study those larger scale actions in the same way you can the simple actions and you should not generalize from the simple actions to the larger scale actions. But it's still going to be a mystery how consciousness could seem to play so little role when it sure seems like I'm consciously choosing, even in the simple cases. Looking at the project overall, um, frustrations, uh, uh, criticisms, uh, in a constructive way to look forward to other kinds of uh, approaches to free will? You know, I think my main frustrations were with people who uh, thought it was a waste of time. And they were on both sides. You know, there were scientists, as you said, who said, why should I talk to philosophers? Uh, but there were philosophers who said, why should I be doing this science? You know, what good is it going to do? Is it really going to change our views? And the answer for me was always, well, I don't know yet. That's one reason I want to do it. Because it might. It might have a big payoff. And until we've done it, until we've tried to work with them, we don't know for sure uh, how big the payoff will be. Uh, and many philosophers uh, are so traditional, they don't stick their neck out and try new methods. Um, and that's frustrating to me, because I think we ought to be trying a variety of different methods so that we can look at a complex issue like this from many different perspectives.